Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Madden America podcast. This is your host for today, Ayurdhidhar. This has been, as always, an interesting month for psychology and psychiatry. Uh, a new study in Nature found that 70 different teams of experts differed on how they would analyze the same set of fMRI scans and came up with vastly different results. Another study in JAMA Psychiatry this month used randomized control trials to find that antipsychotic olanzapine causes, and this is important, causes widespread, widespread cortical thinning. Yet another research published this month in Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry found that antipsychotics are associated with worse outcomes when used on people who are considered, quote, at risk for psychosis. You can read these and a lot more on the Mad in America website. On that note, as we talk about risks, I should introduce our guest for today, Dr. Nicholas Rose. Dr. Rose is a professor of sociology in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, a department that he found at King's College London. He has written and edited around 15 books and published so many articles that I tried to count them and I could not. So I kind of left that. Dr. Rose's work ranges from sociology to psychiatry to biology and politics and more. So I could say he's a towering presence in his discipline, but there are many disciplines out here. But if I were to compress this range in the simplest words, I would say that very often he writes about how modern forms of knowledge like psychology, psychiatry, neurobiology, and others don't simply explain what and who we are and how we think and feel. They also create it and influence it. In other words, popular forms of knowledge are not simply and objectively describing the world to us, but also creating it as we also influence them. This, in turn, uh, is affected by the fact that you know, there are sociopolitical things happening around us. So these disciplines are affected by that, and they contribute to those, especially through what we call governmentality. And we will get into that in a minute, though. Dr. Rose, welcome to Mad in America. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you, and uh, thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. I'm looking forward to it. All right, so let's uh, dig right in, and I will begin with the first question. So a lot of your work is on understanding the side disciplines, you know, psychology, psychiatry, and others, and how they can appear objective, but they are built on a culture's styles of thinking. Now, I'm going to explain what that means. In the simplest word, um, words, a style of thinking is a way of thinking that no one really questions. For example, in psychology and psychiatry, despite whatever theory you choose, you know, whether it's mental disorders are caused by brain malfunctions or psychoanalysis, there is an underlying idea that things that are happening outside us go inside us and become somehow frozen. So we do research on how trauma can be seen in brain scans, how it shows up in unconscious feelings or dysfunctional thoughts, thing inside us. We can say that the side disciplines are made possible because of these styles of thinking. So, Dr. Rose, this work involves a lot of work with history, but your training was initially in biology. So, could you tell our listeners when you became interested in these topics, uh, why you became interested? Was there a turning point? Uh, was it a personal interest, an academic interest? Basically, what's your story? Okay, well, the story is a long one because I'm rather ancient now, uh, but I went to university in the 1960s to read biology. Uh, I was at Sussex University, and my professor there, uh, John Maynard Smith, um, who was a geneticist who worked on fruit flies. Mm. So we all worked on fruit flies and the genetics of fruit flies, which was extremely interesting. But, uh, well, you probably can't cast your mind back, but if you read your modern history, you'll perhaps re uh, remember that uh, something quite exciting was happening in Europe in the 1960s. Uh, students across Europe were beginning to question their universities, mm -hmm. beginning to question the socio-political order, uh, a little bit later on involved in protests against the Vietnam War and so on. And I didn't really think that the truth of those uh, issues was to be found in the study of fruit flies, however interesting that was. And I did genuinely love especially the craft work of the laboratory. So to cut a long story short, I moved, first of all, to the study of animal behavior, which I was not very good at. Uh, my pigeons would not peck their keys, and my rats would not run their mazes. They prefer to starve to death. And then I moved to uh, human psychology. When I moved to human psychology, studying that, uh, I began to ask myself, well, this is a 
kind of peculiar discipline. You read the conventional histories of psychology, and it's as if psychology, on the one hand, goes back to the Greeks. People, the Greeks have always been interested in what goes on in people's minds, etc. And then somehow, suddenly, around the uh, the end of the 19th century, psychiatry, psych, the side discipline, psychology in particular, becomes sciences. So I was reading a the classic history that of psychology that we were all, all given to read was by Edwin Boring, uh, and Boring argued that psychology had a long past but a short history. It was tremendously respectable because it went back to the Greeks, but that was all speculation. And then the history started with laboratory experimentation in the 1890s. Every psychologist knows this story. Uh, and I started having a look at this story, and it actually proved not to be the case. And I can give you one example that was quite telling for me. So at that time, there was a big debate about the concept of intelligence. Mm -hmm. There were debates about the inheritance of intelligence, about racial differences in intelligence, about the way in which schools should, should, should shift people on the basis, sift, sift people on the basis of their, of their IQs and so on. So I started to do a little bit of work on the history of IQ. And to give you one story, studied uh, the work of Alfred Binet. Mm -hmm. So Alfred Binet had been trying to understand human intelligence for many, many years in the, uh, in the uh, late 18th century, just the turn of the 18th, sorry, late 19th century, turn of the 19th, the 20th century. And he got absolutely nowhere. And he really felt that intelligence was so difficult to pin down that you really could not have a concept of intelligence. He did work with his daughters, et cetera, et cetera, studied individuals. And then because of the change in the French schooling system, all children had to go to school. It was after the French Revolution, et cetera, et cetera. All children were citizens, all children had to go to school. And there were some children who did not seem to be able to learn in school. They were stuck in the first classes they went into. And they set up a commission to look at these things. They asked Alfred Binet, uh, Dr. Binet, could you find us a test that would show us which children would do well in ordinary schools and which children had to go uh, to special schools. Um, having studied intelligence for years and years and years and not got anywhere, he then invented a test. And that, in test became, that test became the IQ test, mm -hmm. and that test became the basis of what we think of as intelligence. So this is just a little example of the fact that actually the history of modern psychology does not begin in the laboratory and philosophy and speculative thinking, et cetera, et cetera. It begins, and this was my argument, in very practical questions. It's not that psychology had a great scientific knowledge of the mind mm -hmm. and it was fortunate to be able to apply that to mm -hmm. questions in our practical world. It's because it showed or seemed to show to those who wanted it that it could do a job in the practical world. Mm -hmm. And then after doing the job in the practical world, it in a sense turned into a respectable scientific discipline. So that led me to a long period of study, which eventually ended up in my PhD thesis in my first book called The Psychological Complex, which tried to look at the ways in which the psi disciplines had been not just ways of reflecting upon our world, but actually crucial in the construction of some of the key uh, institutions of our world. In managing armies, for instance, in trying to work out why some people were not very good at working in factories, why there were maladjusted children, why there were maladjusted workers, why there were ch children who were juvenile delinquents, and mm -hmm. so on. Because in all these practical places, the courtroom, the army, the schoolroom, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that the side disciplines mm -hmm. were born. And it seems to me that goes back to your to your original point that you know these practical ways of managing our lives have become, if you like, as important in shaping our ways of thinking. Of course, some children are more intelligent than others. Of course, some children develop faster than mm -hmm. others. Of course, some kids are more inclined to delinquent behavior than others, et cetera, et cetera. It's shaped our way of thinking in some, in some very fundamental ways. And, you know, what you said, I mean, reminds me of two things. Uh, for example, uh, if there is one thing that Foucault ever taught me, and I know I will ask you about him, it was that when someone says X leads to Y, you should at one point also question whether it was Y that led to X. And that reminded me when you said it was about the practicalities rather than the expertise, that Foucault mentioned, mentions that, right? It wasn't just that 
psychiatrists had this great expertise then that turned into knowledge, but their white coatness, their their being, their the fact that there were these institutions that that put mad people in them turned them into places of expertise. So it's not simply that there was knowledge that we applied, but you know the retroactive thing that happened, like you just pointed out. So Foucault point two things. Foucault first of all points out that uh, doctors gained control of the mm-hmm. asylums not because they had such a great expert knowledge of madness, but because they were considered to be wise people in the light of a whole mm-hmm. series of scandals, and especially of commercial mm-hmm. asylums and terrible conditions right. of asylums. Uh, uh, countries, uh, certainly in Europe and in North America, began to say, right, we need to regulate how people go into mm-hmm. asylums and who are going to be the people who are going to do that. Well, it's going to be the doctors, obviously, because they're wise people and we can trust them. Mm-hmm. So... The other thing from from, uh, from Michel Foucault, which I always try to emphasize for my students, links to your question about the origins. Right. So it, Foucault's most interesting book for me is his book about the birth of, of clinical medicine, mm-hmm. uh, the birth of the clinic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what he shows there very clearly is the so-called clinical gaze of the doctor mm-hmm. uh, emerges as a consequence of a whole series of contingent things that happen. Um, changes in French laws of assistance that meant if people were sick and they needed uh, to get health for, healthcare for free, they had right. to go into hospital. Changes in ideas of citizenship. If you went into a hospital, you were still a citizen, so someone had to write down your name and you had to have a case history. Uh, you were in the hospital so people could observe you as your condition developed day after day, week after week and observe lots of others as their conditions develop day after day, week after week. So you begin to get the sense that there's a general pattern of progression of the disorder. And then, of course, you die, uh, and then you go and someone dissects your body, Mm -hmm. and they can make connections between the red spots and the high temperature Mm -hmm. and some internal lesion. And all that comes together to create, and with many other things which we can't go into, to create the conditions for this clinical gaze. So you don't find the origins in the what. In fact, you don't look for origins. You don't never ask why. Mm-hmm. Always say, how did this occur? Right. And how, to say how, is uh, to point to all the little things that come together mm-hmm. and make something change. Accidents of history, right? Conditions of possibility that made yeah. something happen. Absolutely. Uh, so, okay, since we are on Foucault, let me ask you, what was it about Foucault that you know resonated with you? Because so much of your work, and to, to our listeners, uh, Michel Foucault can be called a French philosopher and thinker, but I think he preferred historian of thought. So we'll just call him that. So, okay, what was it about Foucault that resonated in what you were trying to say? So I've always tried to use Foucault's work and not to comment on it. And that's mm-hmm. something which I'll try and stick to. There mm-hmm. are, for those, it's probably got out of fashion now, but there are shelves groaning in libraries full of commentaries on Foucault's work. And I try not to, to, to add to that. But what Foucault did for me was provide some conceptual tools Mm -hmm. to make sense of the questions that I was interested in. He says somewhere history is not so much for knowing as for cutting, Mm -hmm. cutting into questions and, and, and making them intelligible. So clearly, when you talk about the emergence of the psi disciplines, as you said at the beginning, mm-hmm. you're talking about the emergence of a certain style of thought. Mm-hmm. So key to Foucault's argument was that thought wasn't just peripheral. Everything has a little element of thought in it. Mm-hmm. And if you're trying to understand something, you have to see the, the thoughts, the concepts, the systems of thinking that make something possible to think, possible to do something with. So there was that aspect of his work. And of course, you know, as I say, I was a student uh, at Sussex University in the 1960s. I I was studying for a while abnormal psychology. I picked up uh, Irving Kaufman's work, of course, in those days. I picked up Ronald Lang's work in those Mm. days, the so-called anti-psychiatrist. And I picked up a copy of the English, very truncated English version of Madness and Civilization. Mm. Uh, and that had a really profound effect on me mm-hmm. uh, because it wasn't really a history of psychiatry, mm-hmm. but it was a prehistory. It said, under what conditions did something like psychiatry exist mm-hmm. with its asylums, with its doctors, with its diagnostic classifications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I was entering the world of abnormal psychology and psychiatry, going along to mental hospitals, seeing patients being demonstrated Mm -hmm. uh, by their doctors Mm -hmm. and, and, and so on, wondering how some thoughts, statements, that seemed quite natural, normal to me amongst the, amongst the patients were, were seen as psychiatric symptoms. And on the other hand, seeing some of the treatments that were meted out in particular in those days, uh, because psychiatry didn't have very many treatments, it was really before the huge rise of psychiatric drugs, right. the way in which certain behavioral conditioning uh, techniques were being used, mm-hmm. especially for men who were homosexual. Aversion therapy, mm-hmm. uh, attaching, attaching mm-hmm. electrodes to, to their genitals, right. showing them stimulating pictures. Mm-hmm. They became aroused by those stimulating pictures, mm-hmm. whacking them with an electric mm-hmm. shock. And of course, at one level, this was absolutely horrific. Uh, and yet at another level, the people who were doing it seemed, you know, humane, decent mm-hmm. scientists, etc., mm-hmm. etc. You wouldn't have thought that, you know, that they, they were not concentration camp guards. Mm-hmm. How could they think and do these things Mm -hmm. and believe that thinking and doing these things was not only legitimate, but it was scientifically justified, it was objective, it was a form of therapy, it was grounded in scientific research, blah, 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 blah. So these things made me question how those styles of thought had come into existence, uh, how they produce the professionals, mm-hmm. uh, how they produce the professionals, the little experts of Psy, as, uh, as Michel Foucault calls them, who we now see in, in our schools, as I say, schools, armies, hospitals, uh, prisons, little experts of Psy everywhere. And I think that's the importance of knowing history, because I think Robert Whitaker in his book talks about that these methods that seem so horrific to us right now, and you know that's why we have a narrative of progress in psychology. Look how horrifying those things were, but look how much better we are right now. And it's good to remember that there were studies done that showed that these treatments, quote unquote, worked, that they were effective, that they had statistically significant results. And that's kind of the importance of knowing that history. So yeah. For instance, if you look at uh, debates in, in psychiatry, big psychiatric conferences before and after the 1939-1945 war, there was a huge amount of excitement about physical psychiatry, about mm-hmm. electroconvulsive therapy, mm-hmm. about the botanism and so on. Finally, it seemed we had some work, some yeah. uh, techniques that worked, you know, we could actually get into the brain and alter the brain. And, and these were shared, these views shared widely across the people who were then, who were then psychiatrists. And I suppose the question, the, you know, the underlying question mm-hmm. for Madden America is, ah, in 50 years' time, are we going to think the same mm-hmm. about the psychopharmaceutical revolution? Right that began in the Mm mid-1960s and that we are still living with right now. Although Mm -hmm. I I think probably at the, not at the end, not even at the beginning of the end, but coming to a turning point with the drugs as more and more people are beginning to recognize, A, that they don't work very well, B, that the so-called side effects are just as damaging as Mm -hmm. the as, as the effects of the older of the older drugs, you know, the, uh, the tardive dyskinesia type drugs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the brain research is beginning to show, as you mm-hmm. say, that the effects of the drugs themselves on the human brain, that some of the medium to long term consequences of disorders are the consequences of taking the drugs chronically. Right. In the same way as we used to think of schizophrenia as a chronic de- a degenerative right. disease. And that became perfectly clear was a consequence of institutionalization Mm -hmm. in the psychiatric hospitals Mm -hmm. and not of the natural history of the the disorder. So are we going to look back in 50 years' time and think that our obsession with these small molecules uh, to to treat these disorders is just as bizarre as those uh, those earlier treatments? I think the jury's out on that. I mean, my, my sense is that... We're in a bit of a paradoxical situation in that more and more of our fellow citizens worldwide are taking psychopharmaceuticals, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. in particular the SSRIs, mm-hmm. SNRIs, and, and, and those kind of drugs, Prozac and, and its cousins and sisters and brothers and so on, uh, at the very same time as the research is beginning to question right. whether they are effective, mm-hmm. whether they are so lacking in, in adverse effects, uh, as people think. Now, I know 
they're given by GPs, and I've talked, interviewed the GPs. Mm -hmm. GPs think, well, they can't do any harm. One thing we know about these drugs is they they can't do any harm. I used to give my patients um, tranquilizers. I used to give them Valium, et cetera. They were addictive. Some people tried to take their own lives using them. Mm -hmm. These drugs, at the very least, can't do do any harm. Well, Mm -hmm. I I think we're beginning to to see that that story about them is, is, is highly problematic. Yeah, so uh, since we are talking about drugs, uh, I'm going to skip to a question that I was going to come to later. You're right, right? We are at this point when uh, there was just like a couple of months ago, um, this huge meta review that showed that antidepressants uh, don't just have small side effects, like they have long-term lasting, adverse, severe side effects. Um, And I remember writing that article and people in comments just kept coming and saying how disheartened they were when, when they read that. And I was just reporting a piece of research. And, and then, of course, antipsychotics and the fact that psychosis can be triggered by long-term use of antipsychotics because of you know, the, the proliferation of receptors. Now, we know all of this on one side. On the other side, I am just kind of always um, fascinated by the fact that the neurobiological, the, the biological just understanding and paradigm does not seem to lose any vigor. And it makes me wonder, what, what is that? What, is, what gives us that kind of a thinking, that push, that power, and that vigor, that despite all of these new ways of new information and research, it just doesn't seem to go away. I I should say one thing to start with, which is that I think the question of whether the drugs work, let's Mm. park that question. I think some of these drugs can, for some people, provide some short-term relief. Right. Um, in the same way as when you've got a cracking headache, it can provide some short-term relief to take paracetamol or an aspirin or or, or something like that. Um, And maybe that short-term relief is important to enable a person to sort of step back Mm -hmm. a little bit from the crises that may be overwhelming them, uh, to gain a bit of a grip on them, to try and address the real issues which are there. I think that the, with all these drugs, both the, both the SSRI type drugs and the other type drugs, the problem is their chronic administration over right. long periods mm-hmm. of time in increasingly high levels of dosage mm-hmm. with the assumption that if a drug stops to work, stops working, the best thing to do is to add another one. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, polypharmacy is the norm rather the, than the exception. So instead of these drugs being treated as things which, for reasons we don't know, uh, produce some short-term relief, Mm -hmm. there is the belief that, A, we know the reasons, they Mm -hmm. act on the pathway of the disorder, which has never, ever been demonstrated that they act on the pathway of the disorder, and B, that their effects in the medium to long term are beneficial to such an extent that if people start getting adverse effects or if they get adverse effects when they come off the drug, that's attributed to the disorder, quotes the disorder itself, right. rather than the consequences mm-hmm. of going on and coming off the drug. Or the patient. Yeah. Patient is termed as non-compliant, the disorder is termed as treatment resistant, any one of those. But, but the, the tragedy really is that really since the 1960s, this particular paradigm has hegemonized, to to use an old-fashioned word, uh, the psychiatric reason, in that almost all psychiatric reason has thought, A, that psychiatric disorders have something to do with the receptors Mm. and that treatments must act on those anomalies in the receptors and that that's what these drugs do. They work on the receptors. And if it's not, if it's not dopamine, if it's not serotonin, then perhaps it's going to be glutamate mm-hmm. or perhaps it's going to be something else, but it's bound to be mm-hmm. in the receptors. Why not? Um, and yet everything we know about the brain of, of, of humans, I, I worked for a while with this big European uh, Commission-funded project, the Human Brain Project, Mm -hmm. everything that we know about the human brain and indeed the the brains of our primate uh, uh, cousins is that they are hugely distributed, redundant systems where you don't just touch one bit and and that's it. You know, that brain is dynamic, as my my big brother Stephen likes to say, it's a homeodynamic system, so you change one thing and everything changes Mm -hmm. all so we're, we're in a very primitive state when it comes to intervening in the brain. And we're beginning to see some questioning of those 
uh, and those paradigms in the UK. There's a great interest yes. in the UK mm-hmm. in alternative drugs and going back to some of the old psychedelics, which were, mm-hmm. at, in fact, at the root of this belief. Oh, the symptoms of LSD, what happens when you take LSD is a bit like schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. So, and that story is wound into the history of, of drugs for treating psychosis. Uh, but there's some very good work going on in the UK about mm-hmm. the therapeutic efficacy of uh, low dosage of some of some psychedelic drugs. Mm-hmm. Very, very treated rather hostile in a rather hostile fashion by our government and regulators. But um, uh, the work that David Nutt and his laboratory does at Imperial College, I think, is 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 very interesting. The work in the UK is at this point some of the most interesting things from the Hearing Voices Network to the Power Threat Meaning Framework have all come from there. So some really interesting stuff is happening there. You have written about psychiatry's ever-expanding boundaries and how it has turned general discontents of life into diseases. And authors, including yourself, have pointed to various reasons from the powerful influence of big pharma to the isolating effects of neoliberal capitalism. That's where I am. But um, you say there is more in, in a Foucauldian, you know, ethic. Like, it's not a simple top-down thing that Big Pharma is sitting there manipulating everything. It's more complex than that. So could you, right, right. could you first, first, like, speak to what do you mean by these ever-expanding borders of psychiatry? Maybe with an example. And then what are some of the reasons behind it? Okay, let me give you an example. We are, we are speaking in the midst of a pandemic of COVID-19. Yeah. And every time you look at the newspaper, uh, certainly in the UK, you will see stories about the consequences of the pandemic Mm -hmm. and the lockdown on our mental health. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a mental health tsunami coming, an epidemic of mental health. Mm -hmm. We need more psychiatrists, better trained, better access to services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's undoubtedly the case that when confronted by this pandemic, people are anxious. They are uh, discombobulated. Their lives are turned upside Mm -hmm. down. They're locked in. They're wearing masks. They can't go to work. If they're in uh, in situations of great adversity, they can't do the things that they are, quote, supposed to do, like self-isolate, like keep a social distance from the rest of their family. Of course, they can't do that. They're going out to work despite the fact that they're in vulnerable situations uh, uh, because they need the money, or etc., 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 and and it's understandable that people are anxious, they're depressed, they're scared, they're discombobulated, they're worried, etc., etc., etc. But this language of the emotions is not enough. Somehow, all this is recoded as problems of mental health, and you see these problems of mental health everywhere. Now it seems that you know it's it's incredibly difficult to say. Well, perhaps it's perhaps it's better to use the language of the emotions. Perhaps people are just fed up. They're sad. They're miserable. They're seeing their loved ones die. These are normal experiences. They should not be treated as symptoms of mental health problems requiring individualized interventions mm-hmm. by an army of mm-hmm. uh, an army of psychologists and, and psychiatrists. Perhaps one should just step back and one should think, why is it that certainly in our country, the people who are most deeply affected by uh, these, uh, by these uh, situations are people from uh, black and minority ethnic groups living in the worst possible forms of housing, uh, overcrowded, financially vulnerable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's kind of think about those things and intervening on those things. But no, the language of mental health has become a way of coding our everyday discontents. I think you can take this back probably to the period during and after the Second World War. Uh, In the Second World War, because of worries about psychiatric breakdown amongst the troops, uh, uh, people who were recruited into the military underwent psychological and psychiatric tests. Mm -hmm. And the results of those psychological and psychiatric tests seem to show that far from mental disorders being confined to a very small group of people that we could put in asylums, they were very, very, very widespread. Mm -hmm. And after the Second World War, the psychiatrists who'd been involved in the war effort said, look, we've got to realize that these problems are very widespread in the community and we've 
got to begin to think about these as distributed across the population and think about community psychiatry and so on and so forth. So that's, that's a very uh, sort of abbreviated version of this, of this story, but you then begin to see the argument that actually many people, perhaps most people, perhaps all of us are affected by problematic mental health at some point in our lives, and far from that being a kind of normal phenomenon, it's a phenomenon that needs theorizing, mm-hmm. uh, needs analyzing, and needs treating. Um, and you know, in one way or another, you see the emergence gradually over that period from the from the 1950s and 60s through to the end of the 20th century of the expansion of, of psychiatry. There's a, a famous social psychiatrist at the institution where I, where I work, at the Institute of Psychiatry, uh, which is part of King's College in London, called Aubrey Lewis. And years ago, I was asked to give the Aubrey Lewis lecture, and I came across uh, a nice quote from Aubrey Lewis, who said, uh, there is no other profession that I know of that when given a problem and asked if they can help, is so likely to say yes. So you give psychiatrists problems of yeah. naughty children. Mm-hmm. You give psychiatrists problems of, of people who don't like working in the factory. Mm-hmm. You give psychiatrists the problem of people who are on, on the street. You give psychiatrists the problem of people who have you know, challenges in their sexuality. And, and far from saying, oh, no, 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 that's not my problem. They say, yeah, I think we can say something mm-hmm. about that. So psychiatrists have embraced all these problems. The boundaries have spread and spread and spread. Uh, and, and we don't know where to limit those boundaries. Uh, and in the same way, we don't know where to limit who is or who is not a suitable case for treatment. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're all suitable cases for treatment. Right. We're all pre-symptomatically mm-hmm. ill. We right. all are at risk of something. Mm-hmm. And we all might benefit probably for some prophylactic interventions mm-hmm. to prevent us from getting worse. The mantra in physical medicine is the earlier that you detect and treat, the better. Cancer, the earlier, the better. Heart disease, the earlier, the better. Why not in psychiatry? The Mm -hmm. earlier, the better, of course. Mm -hmm. Early intervention for kids, Mm -hmm. early intervention for people who have first episode psychosis, hear a voice or, Mm -hmm. uh, or, or see something. Early intervention becomes... In a sense, psychiatry thinking of itself as having a public health vocation, mm-hmm. um, and and then psychiatrists look at what's happening in the world outside Euro America and see that you know those populations are deprived of access to these uh, to it, not just early interventions but to any interventions. Mm-hmm. That you get the whole movement for for, for global mental health mm-hmm. yeah. uh, emerging there because the psychiatrists believe believe that they know or they at least they have a they have a style of thought that has the potential to know even if it doesn't fully know now it's definitely the way of thinking that is the way of knowing Mm -hmm. and they have treatments that work even if they don't work very well they're on the right path to working so because they think they know how to know and they know how to treat, even though neither of those are perfect at the moment, of course they feel that more and more that people who are deprived of them are, de- are deprived of the opportunities that all citizens ought to have wherever the, wherever the, the accident of their birth, if the accident of their birth is in a place which has uh, one psychiatrist uh, per 10,000, or if the accident of their birth is they have one psychiatrist per... 100,000, they should deserve the same. The the bottom line of that is, I suppose, that unlike many critiques of psychiatry, I think it's important to try and understand why psychiatrists Mm -hmm. think the way they do Mm -hmm. and the internal arguments within psychiatry, because, of course, there are many. Mm -hmm. Psychiatrists are not a homogeneous Mm -hmm. body at all. And to begin to work, in a sense, in collaboration with those psychiatrists, to question from a point of view of what I call critical friendship, try and understand how they think, question how they think, point to weaknesses in the evidence, and also come up with some alternatives. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why in, at the end of my, my book on, on our psychiatric future, 
I do think there's a future for a different kind of psychiatry, which works in a different kind of way, as opposed to, for instance, mad studies kind of people who think the future must be the abolition of psychiatry mm -hmm. and its replacement with something else. Uh, maybe that's a, a sort of collaborationist uh, mm -hmm. uh, position, but that I, I find that position more effective mm -hmm. in, in, in working towards transforming what psychiatry is and what it does than standing outside and throwing rocks at it. So since you're already talking about collaboration with psychiatry, uh, let me ask you this. Service user movements, right? Service user input, service user groups uh, are, are gaining a, a little bit more momentum, which is great, in which they have been at least asked about what are the changes, at least their contribution at what, into what, what, what are the outcomes that we are measuring when we test the validity or how effective a drug or a therapy is. So uh, at least their voices are now beginning to be heard a little bit on the margins. Uh, at one point, this used to be patient advocacy groups, right? But we then found out that many of them have many conflicts of interest, knowingly or unknowingly, with a lot of pharmaceutical companies. Um, and you've written about patient advocacy groups and how they kind of change our identity a certain way into, you know, being a good citizen is being aware of, you know, what are your risks? And I will come to that later. So my question then would be, um, I saw patient advocacy groups get co-opted. Uh, your work, you know, wrote, you wrote about that really well. What about service user groups and um, and their collaboration with psychiatrists? Do you ever fear that uh, survivor groups, service user groups, would their word get co-opted and just be used for the same thing? So if you go back to, to Michel Foucault, Michel Foucault uh, says that the rise of psychiatry cast off into the wilderness all those stammering half-formed phrases with which a dialogue between reason and unreason yeah. used to happen. And the history of psychiatry is the history of that silence. So one thing that has changed is that that silence has been broken. Mm -hmm. Okay? You read any of the reports, you read in the UK, we read the Lancet Commission's reports on mm -hmm. the future of psychiatry. Everywhere a report cannot be written without a reference to the lived experience of people with mental distress, mm -hmm. and ideally involving one or two people with quote, lived experience mm -hmm. of mental distress on the panel of authors, although exactly what uh, power they have in actually shaping that narrative is difficult to know. So is that co-option? I would say, first of all, that perhaps the, the, the involvement of the patient's voice is the most significant thing to happen in psychiatry mm -hmm. since the invention of psychopharmaceuticals, okay? It has transformed, it has the potential to transform psychiatry in a better way than the pharmaceuticals did. And in, to make psychiatry answer to, to the demand that if it claims to be the ben to the benefit of the people it serves, then at least it should listen to their voices to our voices mm -hmm. uh, as to what we think is good for us. Mm -hmm. And that's beginning to happen, and I think that is a, a, a change and a challenge to the power of psychiatrists. They don't just listen to voices as symptoms anymore, oh, partly as symptoms. But there are a multitude of problems which people from the user and survivor movement will be best placed to talk mm -hmm. about than me. You know, the survivor's voice giving legitimacy to something that's already happening. Mm -hmm. The survivor being able to tell a story about their experience, which is then reframed in, mm -hmm. psychiatric, in psychiatric terms. The survivors who do speak out articulately are thought to be non-representative of the others. Of course, most people don't feel like that. You are unrepresentative mm -hmm. because you are talking articulately. Um, the survivors who um, cannot really shape the research strategy, the research questions, the research interpretation, but are there at the beginning and the end in some consultative role. There are all these challenges which I think the people that I know most closely in the user and survivor movement in, in the UK are very, very aware of. So there is a danger of co-option. Uh, but I think there is also the potential of that not of co-option not being the destiny here. 
uh, and we're in the middle of something, to my mind. Mm-hmm. We're in the middle of something, and, and, and groups like Mad in America and so on, who, who foster the survivor's voice and survivor's stories, I think play a, play a, a crucial role. So I wouldn't be too worried about co-option, mm-hmm. but I would think that what's necessary is to recognize that what people who experience mental distress and experience the mental health care system have is not just a of lived experience, but is a different kind of knowledge. Right. But a different kind of knowledge, no less valid, mm-hmm. worked out in collaboration with others, open to challenges, able to give evidence, open to question, should be able to articulate itself and justify itself. But it is a form of knowledge, a different form of knowledge of what it's like to live with these conditions and to live with the therapist for these conditions. Mm-hmm. Right. And of course, it, like psychiatry itself, critical psychiatry, user and survivor, are riven with conflicts, mm-hmm. absolutely riven with conflicts, especially you know, in the area where, where I know a little bit about at the moment, between uh, those who work in the global north and those who work in the global mm-hmm. south, mm-hmm. Uh, about whether or not the survivor's movement is dominated by people from the global north, whether there are autonomous knowledges in the global south, whether there's some virtue in so-called traditional methods of healing, Mm -hmm. um, how one should relate to things like the uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Mm -hmm. and the suggestion that uh, that mental health service users should be treated as people with psychosocial disabilities. Mm -hmm. Of course, these are all highly contested, but that's uh, that's not a problem. I think that's the right. way contest is the way and mm-hmm. argument is the mm-hmm. way in which things develop. Absolutely. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for that. Let me now move on to risk thinking because, uh, you know, attenuated psychosis syndrome just happened. So I thought this is really relevant. So this concept of risk thinking, uh, you've written a lot about it and you say it's The concept basically says that we live in a time where ideas of measuring and identifying risks have become um, embedded in our culture. Uh, So from genetic tests to find out whether one is susceptible to a disease, you know, which is what makes you a good citizen, um, to assessments in schools and offices to evaluate risk. Uh, There is a billion dollar industry of precautionary scanning. And I think um, Peter Gotchi has written about that, about at least mammograms and a really good critique of that. And of course, we are screening individuals for potential criminal behavior. But what is most interesting to me is how we use this in our personal lives and our ideas of managing ourselves and our experience of how we think about ourselves, eating red meat or smoking or dating and, you know, risks involved in that. So could you tell us a little bit about this risk thinking and especially the place of side disciplines in that? And how these two together kind of influence how we think, how we feel about ourselves, how we act. One of the people I most admire who works in this area is Ian Hacking, the Canadian philosopher Ian Hacking. So he talks about risk thinking as bringing the future into the present. Let's bring the future Mm -hmm. into the present and we then feel obliged to think about the future in the present And then when we start thinking about the future in the present, we seem to feel obliged to do things in the present to avert certain things in the future or to bring about certain things in the future. So this link, so the future is always present to us or imagined futures are always present to us. And once they're present to us, it seems uh, irresponsible not to do something about them. You know, if you were told that uh, eating... Uh, 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 a nameless hamburger uh, twice a day with nameless chips twice a day was likely to increase uh, the possibility that you would suffer a heart attack uh, by the age you were 40, it would be uh, hugely irresponsible for you to carry on doing it or be seen as a personal irresponsibility, even though you say, I live in an obesogenic environment, hamburgers are cheap, etc., etc. I can f- feed three to my kids for whatever. Um, so, it, so that inducing of personal responsibility becomes something which has become very, very widespread. Um, and the idea that our responsibility, in a sense, is for our 
physical and bodily health, our bodily existence. It's not so much a responsibility for living a virtuous life or for dying free of sin or for doing good in the world or something like that. Our responsibility is to manage our corporeal existence, our, 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 our weight, our exercise, our diet, etc., etc., to manage that in the present in the name of the future. And that's coupled with a whole series of, uh, of, of uh, technologies, which some of which you mentioned, which claim to bring the future into the present, to make it calculable to us. When we see it in the scan, we see it in the genetic sequence, we see it in your family. And then if you don't do something about it, you know, of course you're free to do it or not do it, but if you don't do it, you will feel very guilty about it. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a, a combination of this general risk thinking of the emergence of a range of technologies that seem to do that, of a, an obligation, a feeling that it is actually in our physical, our corporeal existence. That's the most important thing that we can manage for ourselves and our family, manage our, our bodily being in this, mm -hmm. in this world. It's highly ethical, yes. highly ethical. Right. Um, uh, and, and an ethical form of life is a life to, to manage not one's, not one's sins, but to manage one's, one's bodily existence. And then this takes different forms in different, in different areas. Uh, for instance, probably uh, premonitory knowledge in, in say, cancer Mm. is not so problematic. And why is it not so problematic? Uh, because there's possibly something that you might do about it. Like if mm. you can find early signs of a tumour, you might remove it. Then you get into a kind of technical question, which is the one that you mentioned on, on mammograms. Technical mm. question. How many people do you need to screen to save one life? Mm -hmm. So those meta-analyses of big, of universal uh, mammograms for asymptomatic women in for 40 and above in the Nordic countries mm. seem to show, and I don't have the figures in front of me, that the number necessary to screen to save one life was in the hundreds, if not the thousands, and that the numbers of false positives and the numbers of false negatives were extremely high, and that it was not clear in many cases that early intervention uh, that, that the sign that was detected to indicate the risk of developing breast cancer was clearly enough, uh, was specific enough uh, to warrant that intervention mm -hmm. because many of these signs would not develop into tumours. Right. Uh, okay. and, and the other example, of course, is for, for, for men is using the uh, prostate-specific mm -hmm. antigen test mm -hmm. uh, to pre-identify people at risk of developing prostate cancer. So there's a whole technical issue mm -hmm. about numbers necessary to screen. There's a question about even if you are able to screen people, do you have a treatment or an intervention that's going to avert the thing that you're worried about? Mm -hmm. And then there's the question of, is the knowledge of the future and indeed the intervention going to cause more harm mm -hmm. than good? And in the case of prostate cancer and the PSA test, many, many men had... Uh, uh, surgical interventions into their prostate, which had major consequences for them, mm -hmm. whereas most men who have prostate uh, cancer will die with their prostate cancer. They won't die from their prostate yeah. cancer. They will die from other causes. Um, so there are, there are a lot of technical questions in any area. Um, and every time I've given a talk about this, one person comes up to me at the end and says, well, Dr. Rose, you know what you said about numbers necessary to screen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to save one life? I was that one life. Mm. So mm. the one life that's saved is always thinking their lives have been mm. saved. The 200 people who've been diagnosed with a false positive or with a false negative mm. are probably never known. And then in relation to psychiatry, of course, uh, the question becomes even more difficult because the markers don't exist, um, can't be found, and the interventions don't exist. And, and what you're left with is uh, a, a statement of someone being at high risk without uh, specificity uh, of what that risk indicator is. 
and without any interventions that are going to mitigate that risk, but with the stigma and all the other consequences for the individual themselves, their families, their doctor, their teacher, et cetera, et cetera, of thinking that this eight-year-old kid is at risk of developing psychopathic Mm -hmm. disorders or whatever. There's some research on this, which I've been a little bit involved in debating here in the UK. So that leads to your psychosis risk syndrome Mm -hmm. argument. Right. And I think the evidence there that the, the, the vast majority of people who have one episode that looks as if it might be a psychotic episode never go on mm-hmm. to develop future psychoses, mm-hmm. uh, even if we knew exactly what we were talking mm-hmm. about when we were talking about these things, suggests that it is a very bad move yeah. to start doing those early diagnoses because it carries all the downsides of being identified as a person at risk, thinking of yourself as a person at risk, right. your parents and your teachers watching. The looping your, effect. The looping mm-hmm. effect, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and the last point that I'd make is that when risk thinking gets intertwined with psychiatry and uh, emerges in the sense that the person with a severe psychiatric condition is, at, is risky towards others, and all sorts of special measures of risk assessment have to be brought in yes. just because a person has a psychiatric condition, then I think there are serious injustices mm-hmm. at stake there. It not only damages the relationship between the doctor and the patient, if the patient is always thinking that the doctor is going to be assessing whether or not they're at risk of mm-hmm. damage by other people, um, but it also means that people are subject to long periods of involuntary detention or involuntary uh, supervision uh, on the basis, basis of really quite, um, uh, quite rudimentary and questionable risk assessments. And of course, you know, the, for a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists, like you pointed out, it's not like they're sitting there evil people. Most of them are really trying to help and care about their patients. And uh, the idea, but like research has repetitively shown that despite the fact that we think, oh, you know, like a mental disorder is like any other physical disorder, like um, your diabetes or a broken arm, and those sound good, and it appears that they would reduce stigma, but every little piece of research we have shows the opposite trend, that they increase alienation, dehumanization, uh, pessimism on the part of the person and their family. So, yeah, it's kind of good to, like, remember that. And And... and... There's also a kind of industry of risk assessment, both mm-hmm. among psychiatrists who uh, are brought in as consultants to do mm-hmm. assessments of risk, which carries a certain financial benefit. Uh, when I may, uh, gave a paper on this to a, a psychiatric organization, which shall remain nameless, and I, I said, you know, we should uh, probably give up the being blackmailed by government to make these risk assessments because we're not good at it. Mm -hmm. All the psychiatrists there knew that they were very bad at making risk assessments, but all the psychiatrists also knew that if they gave up the business of risk assessment, you know, there would go the second car, there would go Mm -hmm. the fees for the child's uh, private schooling, et cetera, et cetera. cetera. So there are some financial things which are... Sure, yes, absolutely. Stake. And of course, there's a huge um, uh, biotech industry trying mm-hmm. to develop risk assessment technologies. Mm-hmm. Uh, one that particularly interests me at my age is mild cognitive impairment mm-hmm. and the extent to which you can identify mild cognitive impairment uh, as a high risk of going on to develop uh, dementias. Um, again, I think the evidence for, for mild cognitive impairment being a... Uh, identifiable with any degree of, of certainty and specificity, um, B, being a, a prodrome for uh, dementia is, is really quite problematic. Mm-hmm. So my last question then is, given that we are talking about the biological basis of things, um, you have written extensively about psychiatry and its focus on the brain and how this singular focus on the brain affects how we think and feel and understand ourselves. Um, Attached to this is the idea of what you call somatic individuality. So can you talk a little bit really quickly about how psychology alters how we think and feel about ourselves and what you mean by somatic individuality? Okay, well, what I mean by somatic individuality is something which I already mentioned in Mm -hmm. this discussion, which is the sense that our identity depends crucially 
on our body, its right. shape, its right. size, its fitness, its capacity, right. etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in a sense, that managing our bodily existence becomes the most virtuous thing that we can do to manage our body by diet, etc. You know, the, the 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 feminist argument back in the old days, our bodies, ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, by the Boston Women's Collective, mm -hmm. was meant in a very different way, but in a peculiar way now, our bodies have become ourselves, and ourselves are tied up, very tied up with our, uh, with our bodies. Um, you asked me about the brain, and I just, since, since we're concluding this interview, I just want to say a couple of things about the brain. Brain research has made fantastic progress mm -hmm. over the last 20 or 30 years. We know more about human brains and other brains than we have ever known before. But to use a cliche, the more we know about the brain, the more we realize we don't know the more we realize we don't understand it. We have quite a good understanding of very small-scale molecular events within the brain, but we don't have a good understanding of how those play out across the huge complexity of multiple synapses and multiple uh, cortical pathways that there are in humans and other brains. We don't have a clear idea about how this whole uh, how these brains are located in the body, because brains are often studied in an isolated right. fashion in laboratories or studied in animals, and no offence to mice, but their brains are not neither as big as humans nor as complex as humans, nor is the life course of the mouse, especially the mouse in a, in a cage in, a labor in an animal facility, um, does it have much connection with the life course of a human. Uh, so the brains are not embodied and the bodies are not placed in an environment and the environment is not placed in time and space. And until we can begin to think about that, then I think we won't have much of an idea how brains work. Mm -hmm. The hope uh, was a kind of reductionist hope, uh, an experimentally reductionist hope. That is to say, you would start by understanding the smallest building blocks of the brain. And once you understood those molecules and those synapses, you could gradually, gradually work up, first of all, to the brains of simple creatures like the worm or the fly, and then to brains of more complex creatures like mice and rats, mm -hmm. and then to maybe uh, uh, macaques, and then to higher primates, and then to humans. And that going up the scale has simply not been possible. It's proved to be impossible to do let alone placing all that stuff in space and time. Mm -hmm. So my argument is not that we should cast out neurobiology, mm -hmm. but we should start with the brain, the human brain, as it is, as it develops in an organism, developing from conception onwards, always in interaction with its environment, where everything about the brain is shaped by and involved in making kind of actions in that environment mm -hmm. possible. And if we begin to think in a more naturalistic kind of way about the brain, I think that is actually a more scientifically accurate way of thinking about the brain. Mm -hmm. And that we've pretty much come to the end of these, of these highly reductionist approaches because they've proved unable to answer the question which they set themselves, mm -hmm. and unable to go up the scales unable to know how it's possible for you and I to be doing the weird thing that we're doing mm -hmm. with one another now over, you know, talking, thinking, mm -hmm. communicating, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm all for neurobiology and I'm all for a new relationship between mm -hmm. the neurobiological sciences and the social sciences in which we work together to understand how mm -hmm. from a very early moments in our lives, our experience in certain social and political environments shape who we are and to put it the other way around how if people are experiencing mental distress one can understand that 
in terms of the relationship of their bodies, brains, and human existence in those environments mm -hmm. and not feel that the place where we have to intervene to transform that mm -hmm. is in the molecular structure of the brain mm -hmm. rather than that relationship with the environment. So at that level, I'm a kind of biopsychosocial mm -hmm. uh, thinker when it comes to these things. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rose. This was great. Nice to Good talk night. to you. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.